Hi there, this is Bill Peterson, aka The White Tornado, here for Geek Funk Labs with the sixth in my series of lesson videos that teach you how to use Fluid Patcher, the open source software synthesizer interface that's used in the Squish Box and which can also be useful in a lot of other performance situations as well. In this lesson, I'll show you how you can play backing tracks from MIDI files in your banks and patches. You can even trigger playback from different points in a song or cause different sections to loop continuously. If you're not already familiar with MIDI files, think of them as a way of storing the musical score of a song as MIDI messages, along with the time at which those messages should be sent. You can find lots of complicated documents and diagrams describing the MIDI file format, but you only need to understand the basics of the structure to use them in Fluid Patcher. Like sound fonts, there are tons of MIDI files all over the internet, since this is the way we used to download compact music files before MP3s. You can also use programs to edit and create MIDI files without having to understand the format. Most digital audio workstation software will let you export MIDI tracks as files, and many MIDI editors will even let you visualize a MIDI file as a piece of sheet music. In a MIDI file, note messages specify which notes should actually be played, Program changes define which instruments should be used, and control change, pitch bend, aftertouch, and key pressure messages describe how those notes should be played. MIDI files can also contain special meta messages that do things like set the tempo or time signature, or even store lyrics. One thing that can be a little confusing at first about MIDI files is that messages can be stored in one or more separate tracks. You can think of tracks as different musical parts in a song that are usually intended to be played at the same time. Each track might be a different instrument. Now tracks are not the same thing as MIDI channels. Usually each track in a MIDI file will just have MIDI messages for one channel, but this is really just up to the person who created the file or the program that was used. So that's a quick introduction to MIDI files. Let me show you how you can use them in Fluid Patcher. As you can see, I'm running Fluid Patcher on my Linux desktop for a change of pace, but also because this is where I happen to have a lot of my favorite MIDI editors installed. If I pull up the settings dialog, you can see some small differences in the audio setup from Windows, but I want to highlight this MIDI files setting. This defines the top level directory where your MIDI files are stored, similar to bank files and sound fonts. This allows your banks to be portable from one device to another. You just copy the directories over and then modify the settings file on that device. Let's start editing our bank. So far, I have one simple patch with a preset from the Fluid General MIDI sound font assigned to channel 1. And this sounds like you would expect. Now let's add the ability to play a MIDI file to this patch. First, we create a MIDI player section. Then within this section, each item gets a unique name, much like the sequencers and arpeggiators that we talked about in the last lesson. Now we need to specify what MIDI file will be played. I'd love to use Axel F, but I'm trying to avoid copyright strikes, so I grabbed a generic jazz file off a free MIDI site. Now to get this to play, I want it to be triggered by a button or key on my keyboard, so I need to add a router rule. I've got these three buttons up here, and as we can see from the monitor, this one sends a momentary control change 21, the middle one toggles on control change 22, and this one's a control change 24 momentary button. I'm going to use that toggle button, so I'll add a router rule that selects control change 22 on channel 1. Now I'll add a MIDI player parameter to the rule that connects it to the jazz player. Any value of 1 or more will play the file, and a value of 0 will pause it. So this rule will work fine, but to be really explicit, I'll just clamp those values to 0 and 1. Now, I also don't really need to specify the channel for this message. My keyboard isn't sending control changes on any other channel, so I could just leave this out. So now, if I apply these changes and hit my toggle button, we can hear the MIDI file playing. I can even play along with it. Now you may be wondering how we were able to hear all those different sounds when the song was playing. We only selected a preset on MIDI channel 1, and that didn't even sound like the right piano. How does Fluid Synth know what instruments to play? Let's open up our MIDI file in an editor program, and hide all the tracks except for, say, the bass track. We can see all the note messages in the track, and if we scroll down we can see the other message types as well. And we can see here that at the beginning of the track, there is a program change message that selects the acoustic bass. 
And most MIDI files will have program changes at the beginning of each track to specify the instrument that should be used. And this assumes that whatever synthesizer is playing the MIDI file back is following the general MIDI specification, which sets up a specific instrument or instrument type for each program number. This way, MIDI files can be played back on different synthesizers and still sound pretty much the same. So, in Fluid Patcher, if you load a general MIDI sound font by assigning one of its presets to at least one patch, your MIDI files will usually play back the way you expect. However, you might not always want this behavior. You might want to use different presets for some instruments, or maybe even presets from a sound font that isn't general MIDI. Let's see how you would do that. First, we need to figure out what MIDI channel each instrument is playing on. If we go back to our editor, hide the other tracks, and look at one of the notes in the piano track, we can see what channel it's playing on in the information window. This particular editor numbers MIDI channels starting from zero, so this note is actually on MIDI channel one. The bass is on channel five, and the drums are on channel 10. Let's pick our own sounds for these channels in Fluid Patcher. I'll replace that honky-tonk piano with clavinet. For the bass, I'll stick with the acoustic bass sound. And for drums, I'll go with this Jazz One kit. Now if we play back like this, the program changes in the MIDI file will change our instruments on us. We can block all program change messages using the mask keyword. Mask takes a list of message types, so we'll enclose it in square brackets. And now we can play back and hear the instruments we chose. MIDI players will obey the tempo messages in the file, if there are any. Otherwise they use a default tempo of 120 beats per minute. Just like sequencers and arpeggiators, you can set your own tempo using a tempo keyword. You can also control the tempo using a router rule with a tempo parameter. There's also another way to set the tempo of a MIDI player, sequencer, or arpeggiator that I've added since the last video, which lets you repeatedly tap a control and synchronize that to a certain number of beats. To do this, create a sync router rule with a parameter that points to the player. The value of the message will set the number of beats that are equal to the time between taps. So with this rule, each tap equals one beat, so I should tap on the quarter notes. You can also use this technique to synchronize a player in Fluid Patcher with an external device, such as a hardware drum machine or even a software sequencer running on the same computer. This gets a bit technical, but the external device needs to send MIDI clock messages. Some do, some don't. You'll have to check the user manual. Next, add a router rule of type clock and a sync parameter that points to the player. And now the MIDI player, sequencer, or arpeggiator will be locked to that external device's tempo. I've programmed this Raspberry Pi Pico to show up as a USB MIDI device and to send MIDI clock messages when I hold down this button. One more thing about tempo is that if you modify the tempo in any way, the MIDI player will ignore any further tempo changes in the file. To go back to using the file's tempo changes, just set a tempo value of zero, like with this router rule. With this patch, we've seen how you can play along with a MIDI file in Fluid Patcher. I'm going to make a new patch and demonstrate how you can seek to or loop between different parts of a song, and also have more control over your instruments. For this patch, I've decided to create my own backing tracks MIDI file using one of my favorite free audio recording and composing programs, Qtractor. I really like Qtractor's Piano Roll editing interface, and I can use Calf Studio's Fluid Synth plugins to play my song back using the same sound fonts I might use in Fluid Patcher. Once my song is ready, I can go to Export Tracks to save it as a MIDI file. Back in Fluid Patcher, I'll add that MIDI file to the patch. I didn't put any program changes in my file, so I don't have to mask them out here, but this also means I have to choose instruments in Fluid Patcher, or I won't hear any of the notes on that channel. I'll just add this router rule, and now we can play and pause the song and play along with it just like we did in the other patch. However, what I really want to do with this patch is to be able to play some different lead instrument over the top of these backing tracks. But I can't do that because my MIDI keyboard plays on channel 1, and the MIDI file also has a lot of notes on channel 1, which is going to be true of most MIDI files. 
You can even hear some of the notes colliding and interfering with each other when I play. I could just change the MIDI channel of my keyboard, but a better solution is to add a channel routing to the MIDI player, just like you would for a router rule. This channel routing will shift the channel of all messages in the file up by two channels. So that means I can just change the channels of these presets, and now add my own preset on channel 1. So in addition to playing and pausing a MIDI file, you can also seek to any point in the song. The structure of this song is that it has one measure of intro, then eight measures of a verse, and then an eight measure chorus, and then another eight measure verse. I'm going to add a rule that will let me seek to the beginning of the chorus whenever I press this triangle button. To do this, we add a router rule just like we did to play the file, and I'm also going to only select a value of 127, so it only happens when I press the button and not when I release it. And now, to give the position we want to play from, we add a tick parameter. Now, ticks are the unit that is used to measure the position of all the messages in a MIDI file. Every MIDI file also has a master value for the number of ticks per beat. In this way, you can set the speed of playback by setting the tempo in beats per minute. So here I want to give the number of ticks that gets me 9 measures into the song where the chorus begins. Some MIDI editors will give you the ticks per beat of a MIDI file in some kind of properties window, or the tick value of a note when you click on it. You could also use this handy little Python script I wrote, which is linked in the video description, that will give you lots of info about a MIDI file. When you export MIDI tracks in Qtractor, they will be given a ticks per beat value based on what you set in the session properties of Qtractor. Usually the ticks per beat value is a multiple of 24 for reasons we don't need to get into, but for my funk jam file, I set it to 250. This way, a full measure of four beats is a nice round 1,000 ticks. So the start of the chorus would be 9,000 ticks. That works the way I'd hoped, except that if I don't get the timing just right, the beat can sound kind of off. However, I can set up the router rules so that the MIDI player waits until the end of a measure or bar before it does the seek. To do this, I first add a bar length parameter to the funk MIDI player with the length of a measure in ticks. The bar length could also be multiple measures or even just a couple beats. It just defines at what time divisions the seek will actually occur. Now I have to modify my chorus router rule. If the value of the MIDI message is positive, the seek will always happen immediately, but if it's negative, it will wait until it hits the end of a bar. You can also seek forward or backward in a song by an amount of ticks by putting a plus or minus after the tick value. Finally, let's look at how you can loop different parts of a song. I'm going to set it up so that the two verses of this song will just loop so I can jam over them, and then I can jump to the chorus whenever I want. To loop a MIDI player, you just add a loop keyword to it with a list that has pairs of start and end values in ticks for the loops. Whenever a song reaches one of the end tick values, it will just loop back to the start value that goes with it. The first verse is measures 2 through 9, so that's start and end tick values of 1000 and 9000. The second verse is measures 18 through 25, but if a MIDI player hits the end of a song, it will usually just stop without looping. To be safe, I'll just loop the first four measures of verse 2, so tick 17000 to 21000. Okay, time to jam. One more thing I would demonstrate here if my keyboard had a few more toggle buttons that I think is actually pretty useful for MIDI players is to route those toggle buttons to expression for different MIDI channels. This way you could mute and unmute different instruments in a song while it was playing.
Well, that's all for this lesson. You should have learned a lot about how to use MIDI files to provide intricate backing tracks for your performances. Until next time, stay funky.